Today, we team up with the School of Automotive Machinists to build a 750 horse stroked and blown Mopar we call our heavy hitter Hemi. Hey, welcome to the shop. Earlier in the season, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Hemi by building a 572 inch elephant with the guys from Indy Cylinder Head. This time, we're building a boosted late model Hemi that's gonna make big power. Now, we have some special guests in today that are known in the automotive scene for going super fast in naturally aspirated form. Now, whether it's block design, machining, or fabricating one-off go-fast parts, the School of Automotive Machinists knows how to take it from the classroom to the track and make a powerful statement. Here's a look at what makes them so good. What young gearhead doesn't dream about working with a top professional race team? It's out there. If you're, if you're motivated and you get good training, okay, you can go to work in this industry. Here at SAM, it's education at full speed. In the engine block program, students study race engine theory and the science of high performance. Feed the oil to the lifter galley. In another program, they train for performance cylinder head machining for the race industry. They learn the art of making horsepower in the porting room, on the flow bench, and at the dyno. There's even a program where they can qualify as a five-axis CNC machinist. The husband and wife owners of Sam are Judson and Linda Massingill. You might say racing brought them together in the early 70s. Now they've raced and worked together for more than 40 years. The couple once ran a successful performance machine business where Judd may have trained his employees too well. These guys, once they got trained, we had more work than we could ever do. They would go out and open up their own machine shops. I said to Judd, well, Judd, it seems like all you do is train. Why don't we open a school? That's what you are. You're a teacher. And he says, well, you're right. Since opening in 1985, Sam has earned a long list of important credentials, including a recent National School of Excellence Award. That excellence in education directly translates to employment. The Massengill's daughter, Kim, handles marketing and placing graduates in jobs with racing teams, race shops, and performance industries around the country. We are in a position, a great position, that when our students graduate, they, they, they get jobs. It's on the race side and the machine side, and it just depends on what the student would like to go do and what he's passionate about. It got graduate Matt Grissom a job at Roush Yates in North Carolina after he and his fellow SAM students competed in and won Holly's Engine Swap Challenge. They used their training, skills, and determination to beat a team of older professionals. While his concentration at school was block and cylinder head machining, Matt's got a total passion for engines and high performance. You know, I didn't want to have an office job, I like building things, I like assembling things, I like thinking and working with my hands. So I felt it was a perfect fit for me. Matt helped assemble this True Street LSX engine right here in our shop, where the dyno results were impressive. 785, 605. Nothing wrong with that. That's good, good power. Good power. That engine went into Linda's top speed Camaro for her first attempt at the Texas Mile. Linda and her students hope to get the most out of their school-built drag car. I'm licensed to go 165 to 190, and hopefully the car, uh, we're expecting 175, and I'm looking very forward to that. Her qualifying speed, 191.9 miles per hour. I'm excited. After going through tech and upgrading her speed license, Linda made one final pass. Words cannot explain it. It's an adrenaline rush, but everything went well. So it's a team effort. It's truly a team effort. Coming up, the SAM team arrives for Project Heavy Hitter Hemi. We are back, and so is Judd Massingill, along with one of SAM's top students and two of their instructors. Plus, everything needed to build a boosted late model Hemi. But first, Here's the theory from a master builder. Obviously, we do a lot of LS stuff, but you have to understand that, that what you need is a block with structural rigidity, an adequate oiling system, and heads that move air, okay? So there is no LS, Hemi, Ford. 
You know, they're just either good engines or bad engines, okay? And this is an incredible engine, there's no doubt about it. The block has a lot of integrity in the design of it. The oiling system is adequate for the RPM we're gonna turn, and these heads do move quite a bit of air. But it's all about building cylinder pressure, and we're gonna make it a lot easier using this Edelbrock blower on there. And with that, what we're gonna do is set up a motor that you know is gonna turn 6, 6,500 with tons of mid-range, but try and hold that power up there easily. And with the help he brought, I'm sure it will. Damien is one of the hardest workers that's come through the school. If the doors open at 7, he's there. We go home at 10, he's still there. Goes to the races, works on the race cars. Oh, I got started seeing my dad race, and I was very fortunate that my whole family was in it, not just my dad. I won with the very first engine I ever built. It was actually my first race, and definitely wanted to be better than my father. The block he's prepping is from Indy Cylinder Head, a brand new Mopar production piece. It sports six bolt mains and required very little machine work to get to this point. It even came painted orange for the Mopar look. Damon, are you all set? Chris Ready? Bennett is the lead instructor in block assembly and machining, and it begins with a light coat of royal purple oil to protect the Clevite 8 series bearings until we prime the engine later on. The backbone of the engine is a K1 crankshaft. It's a 4340 forged steel unit capable of handling every bit of power we're going to throw at it. Now it required balancing and some final touches to set bearing clearances from Sam. For safety, we placed rod bolt sleeves on the studs so there was no chance of nicking the crank. The main caps are next. After slicking up the bearings, the ARP studs will be used as guides to align them. Now they're numbered and have an arrow for direction. Using a rubber mallet, the caps can be seated to the block. A light coat of ARP Ultra Torque will ensure a proper torque spec. Now the way to torque the mains is from the center out in two steps. The first pass will be at 50 foot-pounds. Once reaching the first click on the wrench, stop. That means you've reached the torque setting the wrench was preset to. An additional click will only increase the torque value. The outer side bolts are tightened to 25 foot-pounds. The final pass is to 100 foot-pounds. With that, the mains are done. Now the crankshaft end play is checked and is in a safe range right at five thousandths. Motor oil is going on the journals and Comp's cam lube is going on the lobes. It's a custom Comp camshaft that was spec from Chris Bennett at SAM. Now it's a roller with gross valve lift on the intake and exhaust at 576. Duration at 50 thousandths for the intake is 225 and the exhaust side is 234. The lobe separation angle is 115 degrees. A thrust plate that houses the tensioner will keep the cam from walking forward. Now the comp timing set can go on. It has multiple keyways to advance or retard the cam timing and the camshaft position reluctor is attached to it. Pull in the pin will release the tensioner and tighten up the chain. K1's 4340 forged H-beam rods are 6125 in length. They have a .866 diameter pin and will ride on Clevite H-series bearings just like the crankshaft. Attached are Wysico's forged pistons that have a 1080 compression height and a 13cc dish. Their GFX ring pack uses a Napier second ring and a barrel face steel top ring. Pre-lubing the piston and bearing with motor oil is a must. Now a total seal compressor is used to keep the rings in the piston grooves as they slide into the bore. Now make sure the big end of the rod is in the right position and does not touch the journal. The only thing that should touch is the bearing. ARP 2000 rod bolts will hold them together. Now they get torqued to 50 foot-pounds. This rotating assembly will give our Hemi a true 426 cubic inches. Out back, the cover that houses the rear main seal can go on, and up front, the Melling standard volume oil pump can go into place. Now the Hemi has a shoulder on the sprocket that centers the pump with the crankshaft center line. The next step is to set the oil pump pickup to the pan clearance. The oddball main stud is used to set the height of it using a couple of nuts. Next we're going to check the clearance between the pickup and the oil pan depth. We're going to do that by placing tape over the screen and placing clay on top of the screen, putting the pan on, pushing it down. Then you can remove the pan and measure the thickness of the clay. Looks like 250 thousandths. Now add to that the width of the gasket and windage tray. With a grand total of 388, we are well within spec. With the pickup removed, the timing cover needs to be installed, followed by a gasket for the windage tray. 
The tray is from Mylodon and will disrupt the vortex of oil caused by crankshaft rotation and the return of the pickup, followed by another gasket. Finally, the Mylodon six quart pan can go on. Now it's made to swap late model Hemis into old A, B, C, and E bodies. It's time to move on with the build. Here's something to keep in mind. An engine is an air pump. The more air you get through the heads and into the cylinder, the more power it makes. We need to take into consideration all the parts that we're going to be using, including the pistons so we can get our chambers a proper size, the valves that we're going to be using, and then the valve train parts so that we know that all the parts will actually work together. And here's what he came up with. These Ferreya 2200 intake valves have been polished to promote maximum airflow. The Manly exhaust valves got the same treatment and measure 1650. Now they get dressed with comp cam springs, retainers, and locks. The exhaust valve received a minus 50 lock to achieve the correct installed height. And the porting job speaks for itself. We're seeing about 420 CFM out of the intake, which is really good because the whole port is so straight with the back of the valve that it flows a lot of air. And his upgrades continue including the lifters. Factory lifters are okay. What we have is more lift, more spring pressure, and faster ramps on the cam. So we got these lifters from Jessel. They have a tighter tolerance between the axle and the wheel, a much harder wheel, and a harder surface finish on the body. They're lighter than traditional tie bar lifters, available in several different diameters, and include full internal oil circuits. A Jessel dog bone plate will keep the lifters square with the camshaft lobes. ARP studs and Cometic multi-layered steel gaskets with a compressed thickness of 60 thousandths will seal the heads. With the high cylinder pressure from the added boost, we want to make sure the head is pulled down even and seals properly. So we'll torque them in three steps, 50, 80, and 100 foot-pounds. The Smith Brothers push rods are solid and have a radius cup tip. Now they're a three-piece design. The intake side is 7800 in length, the exhaust 9800. The rocker assemblies are a newly updated design from Harlan Sharp. They have bronze bushings that ride on the shaft and a 1.65 ratio. The push rods will seat to Jessel's tool steel ball adjusters that are installed in the rocker arms. Now they have less friction than cup style adjusters to free up a little power. Edelbrock supplied the balancer we're using and an ARP bolt will secure it to 140 foot-pounds. The accessory drive has to be for a car, not a truck, since they are different. Now, running the setup on the dyno will allow us to see exactly what the engine makes with the parasitic loss from having to turn it. The only thing missing is the power steering pump, since the car this one's going in has a manual rack. We checked all of these. When it came to lashing the valves, Judd couldn't resist lending a hand. Watching these guys work on it, they're my ego instead of the engines, you know. Get a lot of fun out of them watching them just going through the process and, you know, the light comes on, I call it, you know, and then everything's great after that. If you're a gearhead, you know, you get it, and if you're not, you never understand it, but I go to work every day, it's like going to Disneyland, you know. Your life's a lot better when you get up every morning liking what you're doing. It's dino time, the final exam for the SAMS team. We are back with the crew from SAM. They came, they built, and we are about ready to conquer. Searching for over 750 horsepower out of the supercharged stroked late model Hemi built by their students. The Edelbrock E-Force Race Supercharger is designed for race use only and can support just over 700 horsepower. Now several blower pulleys are available and custom tuning is required. To let it breathe, stainless American racing headers with two inch primaries that feed a three and a half inch collector. Now connectors from our Holly EFI are mating to Excel super coils. We're using them for more spark energy due to the higher cylinder pressures from the boost. Now Dietchworks 95 pound an hour injectors from Summit will feed the 426 cubic inches. Now the harness also connects to the cam and crank sensors plus many more. At the other end, the harness will plug into a Dominator ECU. Now they only fit in one location. The main power harness from the battery will plug in as well, followed by the drive-by wire harness for the accelerator pedal. 
After a couple switch 12 volt connections, we can fill the reservoir for the heat exchanger and get ready for a fire up. We'll make a few short pulls so Chris has a good base to build off of. These are just as a reference. I'm ready to go. Here we go. With 13 degrees of total timing and a target air fuel ratio of 11 and a half, we'll make the first pull from 35 to 6,500 RPM. All right, 623 on power, 601 on torque. Now he'll add a degree and a half of timing in the mid and upper RPM range to 14 and a half. Everything's going great. Put a little more time in this thing and see what it does. We want to be careful, but I think we're off to a heck of a start right now. The RPM range will be the same from 35 to 6,500 RPM. 653 horsepower, 601 foot-pounds of torque on three pounds of boost. Now the same torque number is explained by only increasing the timing above the torque peak. It's time for a pulley change on the blower. Now we're going from a three and a half inch to a three inch one that'll raise our boost to just okay, this, over this six pounds. Here. No, 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 no. Yeah, this is it. Look, this goes That's here. Right. Yeah, we're there doing the same go. thing. No changes in the Holly software for this run. Everything but the pulley is the same. 701 on power, 673 on torque. Not bad. And six pounds, <laughs> yeah, not bad at all. Let's add one degree of timing to 15 and a half. 716 horsepower, 676 foot-pounds. Now that's it for the three-inch pulley. Now the swap to the 2.75-inch and race gas. This should give us right at eight pounds. That was a good pull. Yeah. 742 horsepower, 715 foot-pounds. Now Chris is going to lean it out to achieve a 12 and a half to one AFR and add another degree of timing for the final pull to take advantage of the extra octane. 780, 745. That's awesome. Damien, congratulations. Awesome. You and the other students did a great job on putting that together. Thank you. Mike, good running. Chris, good tuning, good parts. Can't ask for much more than that. The students back at the shop, they'll be proud of that. You know, this is like their football team. Uh, th this is where the jocks hang out, is with these engines to them. When a 34-pound build of aluminum bar is chucked into a CNC machine, what could be the outcome? How about the nicest production valve covers available? These are Moroso's late model Hemi valve covers made for the 5.7, 6.1, and 6.4 liter cylinder head. They require the use of 06 and up coil packs, and they're actually a little bit taller to clear aftermarket valve train assemblies. Now, if the natural finish isn't your thing, they're also available in a black anodized coating with prices starting at just over a thousand bucks. If you have a small block Chevy and want more top end power and better throttle response, these Edelbrock Performer RPM cylinder heads are the best way to make that happen. Now they come fully assembled with springs, retainers, locks, guide plates, and studs. Underneath, these things sport a 65cc combustion chamber with a 202 intake and a 160 exhaust valve. Now they're sold individually with a price at right at 680 bucks. Now I hope you really enjoyed the heavy hitter Hemi and all that awesome power it made whether we take it out on the street or the racetrack. Now we owe a lot of thanks to the guys from the School of Automotive Machinists for making it happen and I'm sure it's not the last time you'll see them around. Until then, we'll see you next time.